Wow, here we are again today. Glad to be with you today. Let's look in the book of uh, Colossians in chapter 3 and verse 16 and verse 17 and read what Jesus says that we need to do. He said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. On a daily basis, if you have connection with God, if you have said, Jesus, I am a sinner, forgive me of my sin, come in my heart, save my soul, now you have a direct line to God. Direct line. You and God are in the same direct line. Now, what are we supposed to do? We are supposed to worship in our hearts on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, minute by minute. It takes 60 minutes to make an hour, and in each hour, there each day, there are 24 hours. If you are fellowshipping with God in those minutes, you're fellowshipping 24 hours a day with God. And that's what you're designed to do. And that's what you're supposed to do. That's what God designed Adam to do. And the devil came along and took that. Do you know there's 168 hours in a week? And do you know that God said that we are supposed to put 16.8 hours a week as a tithe to God, tithing our 10% of our time to directly to God. That means we need to study 16.8 hours a week. We need to go out and pass out tracks and do things uh, part of that 16.8 hours a week. We have to uh, enhance somebody, do something. Uh, we were at a table. Uh, eating my friend and I last week and God spoke to me and said the girl that is not our waitress to give her a tip and a try and to uh, comment on the, her good job she was four times better than the waitress we had I gave our waitress a good tip and a try but that was not because she was a good waitress but because she was the waitress but the other waitress that was a good waitress, I gave her a tip in the try and told her, I think you're probably one of the best waitresses I've ever seen. And so God wants us to do that with other people, people around us. If we live Christ-like, we will act Christ-like. We will reward those people with the things So it says right here. It says grace in your hearts to, be, to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, that means you say it with your mouth and you act with your hands. In word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. What are you giving thanks to? Hey, I thank the Lord I could give somebody two dollars. I've seen times in my life when two dollars was like gold. Uh, at 76 years old, uh, back when I was a young man, Two dollars wasn't much more than a day's pay. I've seen working a day for 50 cents an hour. And I've seen out picking blueberries to get a quarter of blueberries or a half a gallon of blueberries or out picking beans in the field. And you got paid according to how many you got. Or picking potatoes when I was a kid. They'd turn the potatoes up on the ground and you had to take this little hod with you and you filled it up and you filled a barrel. And you got a dollar for a barrel of potatoes. A half a day's work. And so, I tell you what, we're in a different day and age now where you, have, you get multiple dollars per hour, but it costs you multiple dollars a bottle of bread. Or a jar of coffee, or a jar of jam, or anything. It's, it's 20 times what it was when I was a kid. <clears throat> so that's what the world we live in today requires a little different thing. As we go forward, we must, it is imperative that we get in God's Word so we'll know how to walk. God's Word is the road map for us on a daily basis. If you get up in the morning and you don't have some prayer, 
if you get yourself a breakfast and you sit down and gobble it up and you haven't said, thank you, Lord, for this breakfast, there's something wrong with your life spiritually. You have a spiritual dysfunction in your life if God is not always first in your life. He said, I saved you. At least you could do. I took you out of the pits of hell and I'm going to give you heaven forever. Wouldn't you think the least you could do is thank God for the mouthful of food I've given you? Wouldn't you think you could thank Him for a day, for this day? And as I've said before, this is not a good day if it's not a godly day. It has to be a godly day to be a good day. Do you know that every tree, the type of a tree from its root to the top is the same? If I look at a tree and it's a cedar tree, I can say that's a cedar tree. Am I going to find acorns on a cedar tree? No, I'm not. Am I going to find God on the devil's tree? No, I'm not. If it's a devil's tree, all the nuts you eat from that tree are anti-God. But if it's God's tree, all the nuggets and the nuts He gives you are spiritual. And you will be able to have fellowship with Him and fellowship daily with Him. Will you ever be perfect? Not in this body. Will you ever have perfect knowledge? You will if you're in the Bible. The Bible, B-I-B-L-E, that we sang when we was kids, is the truth. And the song was the truth. It's God's book. And every word in it, God put there. What do we need to find out? The sheer volume of the Bible, from Matthew to Revelations, looks like a lot. But it's not so much. If you get in it and study it from cover to cover, you'll find out that it's not a, a, that great a challenge. I, I went through the Bible in four years and, and uh, did test after test after test after test after test. And, and in those tests, what did you do? You explained what each book of the Bible says, what it was there for, what it was put for there. It's a pair of steps. And you're walking up them steps. You start on step one. Don't be looking up at 1,000 up there. You just do what step one is, and when you get done, you go to step two. When you get step two done, you go to step three. What are you trying to find out when you're studying the Bible? Your first thing you're trying to find out is why. Why? Why did God write this Bible? And once you find that out, He wrote it for you and I, the Christian. He wrote that we would know how to live opposite of what the, we lived before we started getting into it. And then after we find out the why, we find out the who. Who wrote it? God himself engineered the Bible and had it written, and he had it written by men. He had it written by men. We are the hands of God. We are the mouth of God. We are the person of God out here. And if we're not showing ourselves as godly, then we're not doing what God wants us to do. He chose to use human beings. He made a man, Adam, that he didn't have to make. But he made Adam to be the first man to proclaim the gospel of God. So now we know the why and the who, but what? What does this book contain? It contains the way of life for a godly man. Do you want to know how you can find out who the godly man is? Did you read your Bible this morning? Did you say a prayer this morning when you got up? Did you say a prayer last night when you went to bed and said, God, give me a good night's sleep. Uh, give me good thoughts during the night, Lord. Give me some uh, spiritual visions during the night, Lord, of something that could be done that you could use me to do. That I could step out above and beyond the average man, what an average man would do. And, and have the faith to do it. That's the why. Now the why. The why is, is that God has built this earth for one time and one time only for this group of people. 
The Bible said that there is going to be a new earth and a new heaven one day with a new group of people. When this one is finished, this earth is going to be taken by the hand of God and cast into the lake of fire to burn forever and ever. And all the souls that have passed through this earth since it was put here, uh, 2018 this is, years ago, uh, from Jesus to here, and before that, the 2000, what we see is we're going to have about a 7,000 year earth, more than likely, cast into the lake of fire. And we're going to be in heaven. That's the why. Now, what is the root? What are the roots? We talked about a tree a minute ago. The Bible is a tree. This is a living tree. The fruit are on the pages. If you want the fruit of this, you've got to read it, look at it, and say, God, what is the fruit? He said, comfort ye. Comfort ye my people, saith our God. I opened up to Isaiah 40 and verse 1. And what does it say? Comfort. That's what I'm doing. I'm telling you how to be comfortable in God. How to be comfortable in your life. Speak ye the comfortable to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Whoo! Ha ha ha! I'll say it one more time. 1972, November 5th, 3 o'clock in the morning. I received total forgiveness for a wicked life. And this is it. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make us straight. And the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert and in the highways for our God. This was John the Baptist coming in the New Testament. <laughs> In the book of John, John the Baptist came. These were the very words he preached. Isaiah chapter 40 tells about John the Baptist coming. Tells about him baptizing Jesus Christ. Look at verse 5. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. That's talking about when, when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, God spoke from heaven. And said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. How about that? Hey, all the way back in Isaiah chapter 40. Tells us this is going to happen. And then a, a thousand years later or so, it happens. And just exactly as the Bible said. Do you know it's the only book that was ever written. That every single solitary thing that was supposed to come true right till today has come true and it can't be refuted can you imagine God telling somebody a thousand years before it happens that you that Jesus is going to say there's a colt over there the fold of an ass untie it and bring it to me and it happens a thousand years later wow Everything that was prophesied in the Old Testament that has come, has, that's come true said it would. And that which hasn't come true yet, it will. It is going to come true. So we now, we see the why, the who, the what, and uh, the where and the when. And this is the, the root of the Bible. That's the root of this tree, the Bible. This is the only true tree. This is the tree of life. God talks about taking of the tree of life. This is it. Jesus gives us life through this tree right here. We, if we'll eat from the fruit on the branches of this tree, the words on the leaves of these pages right here, if we'll eat from them, we will have the truth in our life. We'll have what we need. And, and God will give it to us. Let's look at another thing about this book and the details in it. We do not have to go to a theological seminary to learn what this book says. 
if we we'll read it every single day, we are reading, we are doing theologically sound work. We are in school daily without going to a classroom somewhere. If you read this every day, you are getting theologically sound. You are getting what some people pay. They go to a seminary to learn what this says when they could sit on their couch in the morning and read a chapter and ask God to show it to them, look at it backwards and forwards, Look at the good, a good book. This is a good one. It has the center references in it. I can read a verse and go to the center reference. It'll tell me to go back and look at where it said back there and to go forward and it'll explain what it says. This is a seminary book right here. This is your seminary book. You don't need, uh, you don't really need one like this. Even though this is a nice one. And this is called Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. I have the pages of this book. No matter where I open up, I've been through this book from cover to cover. It's, it's all marked from cover to cover. I studied this book. It is the whole Bible in this book. And it tells about it. And it explains it. It explains it properly. Mr. Wilmington did a very good job here. And he used the Bible that I use, which is the King James Version. If it's not the same, it's different. If it's different, it's a perversion. It's not the same. The same is the same. It's different. I could call an orange a banana. It will never be a banana. It will always be an orange. I could call a banana an orange. It'll never be an orange. It'll be a banana. The two opposite things. If you write something different than this right here says, then it's not the same. It's wrong. So the same is the same. Remember that. To begin building a library of true books, you start with this one. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and go on through. New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and go on through. And, and these books, 66 of them, are the first books you need in your library. After you've read this one time through these 66 books, you can read through in a year very comfortably. Most of these Bibles have a reading program in the back. How you read through in one year. You read through in one year. Now you're ready to start back over again. And now you're ready to start getting some other books that explain these books too. Help you. In, in layman's the theology, in layman's terminology. Now you've got to remember the Old Testament, it, we would say the words were archaic or they were old words, but they were words of strong meaning. If you go back to those words, you go back to the many, many names of God in the Bible. Each one had a characteristic of that name. One of those names is the most powerful God. One of those names is the most pleasant God. And one of those names is the most wonderful God. And those names mean different things. They were said at different times. So when you begin building a spiritual library, start with the 66 books of the Bible. And then get a spiritually factual books written by factual people. I sat on the, in the 1970s, I used to go to Tennessee Temple a lot. That was a college in Tennessee. And they, they spoke the truth. And they had preachers come to conferences. And we would sit under some of the best, the best true preachers you ever heard in your life. And they told the truth. They were expositors of the Bible. They expounded what God had showed them on a daily basis. And then we did something else there. The Bible said assemble together as the matter of some is that they don't. But assemble together with those of like faith. 
So here we are, assembling together with somebody of like faith. Here I am, a brand new Christian, and I'm learning the depth of the Bible in the first year I was saved. Learning the depth, like going down in deep water. And then, uh, it, it, and, and God gave us the information out of the Bible that we needed by the mouth of men and as it was growing in the word uh, the key word we need to see what the key words of the Bible are God is a key word of the Bible the author of the Bible is God himself and he narrated those to write them and, and, that, and they're very concise the words are and, and you can take any word and exhaust it. I have a, a, some several exhaustive concordances that take a word. And I have some words that take two pages for them to explain that word. It has so much. It's so concise in that. And then we have, usually with every book, there's a summary before the book. And there's a summary after the book. Now, I'm doing a summary right now on the whole book. The whole book, the Bible. We're summarizing what the Bible is. It is a school teacher. It is a school master. And you can read it for yourself and you can put the demeanor in it for yourself. If you want to read it real starch, and God said, wow. Wow. Have you ever had a teacher that says things like that? And this is the way it is. Well, this is the way it is. But you can say it in different manners. This is the way it is. <laughs> or this is the way it is. And, and that's it. Pastors are all across this earth have different demeanors. Some are very meek and very mild. And they speak with very simple, plain, light words. And then there are some that are hollerish. They holler the word out. The same word in two different ways. To be received of people. And, and we are to be effective teachers. How do you be an effective teacher? You just teach the best way you can. Some teachers do the best way they can and they're not effective. They're just not effective people. And you need to be, to be effective, you need to know what you're teaching. If you want to uh, offer people something right at the end of their fingertips quickly, you've got to know it yourself. And if you know it yourself, you can transfer it to somebody pretty quickly right at the end of their fingertips. Spiritual facts. The effectiveness of what a book says or what a verse says. Just think back here in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 1. Comfort ye my people, saith your God. What comforts his people in a church building? The true word and the expositor that's telling it with the truth and is making you want to desire. I've got some little uh, notes right over here on the side. Give yourself to the book. He will give himself to you and then you can give it to others. If you'll give yourself to this book, he will give this book to you and you can turn around and give it to others. Man. This is what it's about. Passing it on. Do you know it's a free book? You might have bought it, but the free life that's in this book, it's a free book. Salvation is a free gift. You cannot work for it. I have said to people before, are you saving this? I'm working at it. Well, forget it. Forget it. 
just quit working. Just you might as well just go ahead and live your hellish life like it is because if you're working toward it, you're not in. And you'll never get in. You can't work for it. It's a gift from God. You have to accept it. It's free. And say, Jesus, I am a sinner. I say here, my friend, the curriculum of the Bible is spiritual, not carnal, not of the flesh. It's a spiritual book written to the spirit of a man. The carnal flesh is supposed to fall in place, but it's written to the man, the internal parts. For without the body are wars and rumors of wars, and there are spiritual wars. The person that says, I'm working on it, or I'm fighting, or I'm trying, those are wars that are warring against the spirit of God. They're warring for the spirit of the devil and keep a man totally confused. These are my own notes. Having the knowledge. Knowledge without the spirit is dead knowledge. Knowledge of the Bible without the spirit of God is dead knowledge. You can say a lot of the words out of the Bible and they to, will mean nothing if it's dead knowledge if you haven't got it completed properly and in the proper place. You know a body without a head is dead? <laughs> Think about it. You've got the head off this body. You've got a dead body. If God is not your head, you're a dead man. If God is not your head, you are a dead man. Do I need to say that again? If God is not your head, you are a dead man. You say, but I'm alive. Look at me. You might as well not be. If you haven't asked Jesus to forgive your sin and come in your heart and save your soul, you're going to hell. Boy, oh boy. Do you know hell is full of live people? When they pass from here to there, they're alive. Luke 16, 19. The Bible said, and the rich man in hell lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Seeth Abraham afar off and says, Hey God, will you send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in a drop of water and cool my tongue? For I am tormented in this flame. This is a live man in hell. Had his eyes, had his mouth, could see into heaven. Can you imagine being squirming in hell forever? Being in fire forever? Desiring a drop of water forever? And on top of that, being able to see into heaven all the people rejoicing? All the people around the throne of God? Sitting around the table of God? Eating from the twelve manner of fruit along the river of life that comes from the throne of God? Walking on streets of gold? Living in perfect harmony and perfect peace. And I'm not talking about a little bit of time like a hundred years that when man lives. I'm talking about forever. I'm talking about you can have a mansion up there. Jesus said, I'm building you a mansion. Well, if he's building me a mansion, have I sent him a nail today? Have I sent something up there? Have I spoke to a person about him and said, Sir, if you died right now, would you go to hell or would you go to heaven? Have I done what my duty is today? When I do my duty down here, it sends something up there. I would like to have a chimney on my mansion. I would like to have a fireplace in it whether I need it or not. Many, many people build houses today, put fireplaces in them, they never one time ever lit a fire in. They're for looks. But the real purpose of it is to heat the house. But many people today do things that have no purpose. But I want to see purpose. We need purpose in our life. These are my notes over here. He is the king of the kingdom of heaven. He is the one 
that we will want to bow down to. He is the Holy One, the Holy One of all existence. He spoke it, and it was here. He spoke it, and it was here. This is the Holy One. After He comes to us and says, Ask me to forgive you your sin and come in your heart. Our duty is, is to make other Christians. Our duty is, is to uh, counsel and make others feel good. When John 3.16 was living, I was written, it was written with purpose. For God, the God that created the heavens and the earth, He so loved mankind that he made a redemption plan and he gave his son to die on a cruel tree and shed his blood that we could get forgiveness of sin and we could come into the Christian union of those who are headed to heaven. Three in one. Three things he did. The death, the burial, and the resurrection and showed us that we can have that. That we will raise again on that day. We had the creation stage. God's hand speaking and mouth. Then we had the patriarchal stage in Genesis 12 through 50, all the way to Job. And if you'll read Job, You'll say, would God allow a man, human being, to go through what Job went through? Just think, every second that you're under some kind of persecution, you're piling up good stuff in heaven. <laughs> I love it when God said to Peter, you go over there and you tell that rascal Paul, who was Saul, what he's going to have to suffer to serve me. The last Christian he killed was Stephen. He had killed hundreds, thousands of Christians. He had sent them in chains to Rome. When he was walking across the, the earth, <coughs> he had a group of soldiers with him. And every time he wanted to send one back to put them in the, to fight the lions, he would take a soldier and he'd say, chain these five up, these ten up right here. They call themselves Christians. Take them back to Rome and put them in the Colosseum <coughs> so the Romans can holler and ooh and ah at the lions eating them Christians. <coughs> and that's what he was doing. And he was going across the earth threatening the Christians and taking them. And, and for some reason, Stephen uh, said something to Paul that he really didn't like. He said, stone that man. And they stoned him to death. And Stephen, what did Stephen say? Last thing he said, lay this not to their charge, God. They know not what they do. Wow. The very thing Jesus said on the cross. We need to stay, we are entitled to use the main curriculum of the Bible, which is salvation by grace, a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. If you're working your way to heaven, forget it. You're not going to make it. The only way you're going to get there is a free gift. Hey, Tim, how about letting that dog out? Uh, so, we need to look at the proper curriculum, the curriculum of salvation, a free gift from God. In Exodus stage, in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, we see that God was moving the people from one place to another to a place of where He could speak to them. And we are to exodus from the things of the world when we get saved. This is why God was showing us through the Bible the things that we are to do. The books of the Bible give us a way of life. And where to follow that way of life. I love the conquest stage where Joshua was used to fight the battle of Jericho. 
This was an impregnable city. It had a great high wall. And then about 30 feet out further out, it had a wall about 8 or 10 feet tall. And all of the soldiers were behind that wall standing on platforms all the way around the city. So if you came at that city from any direction, strategically, you would be killed. You couldn't get over that wall. And if you did get over that wall, you couldn't get over that high wall. That was an impregnable city. And God said, nothing's too hard for me. <coughs> you do what I tell you. You marched around that city one time every day for seven days, six days. And on the seventh day, when you march around it, you all get around it and you stomp. And you blow your trumpets. And you stomp your feet. And you praise God. And the walls will fall in. And they did. And they blew their trumpets. And the walls fell down. Except for one place. Where Rahab the harlot had hid those spies when they came in. God left her house standing. You know it was an amazing thing. For God to knock all them walls down, to shake them down, and they all fall down. And what's more amazing about that, that he shows us for one person that followed him, he would leave them standing alone. When the whole crowd around you falls down, and you'd be standing alone there. Here's Rahab alone standing there. Well, and her family. She brought her family in. Was her family saved? I don't know if they were or not, but I know one thing. When God delivered Noah, He delivered His family. And Noah is the one that was saved. When God delivered Lot, He delivered His family. The one that looked back, His wife turned into a pillow of salt. But He delivered those other children who sinned almost immediately. Noah's children sinned almost immediately. So we find that the devil is the author of sin and he's going to stay here and he's going to work on it and he's going to work on it hard. So this was the conquering stage uh, in the book of Joshua. Judges and Ruth and 1 Samuel were a stage where God was dealing with the people on an individual basis. With one person at a time and giving them statements and they were to be leaders. And they, and they were to have followers. And that's what they were to do. And, and that is, that is a judges. We had the United Kingdom stage. That's when Israel was all united as one kingdom. Do you remember in the 1800s, in the 1860s, the United States of America had a war between the North and the South? That was the same thing that uh, Israel had. They had a division in their one kingdom and they divided up and went out into 24 different directions. And in those 24 different directions, they became enemies of each other with different ethnical ideas and different ideas. And that was that stage, and it's written for us in here. Chronicles, Psalms, Song of Solomon, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, our books of wisdom. Those who wrote the Psalms were the most famous Psalm of all which is the Lord is my shepherd. One man named David out there on the field taking care of the sheep at night saying the Lord is my shepherd. I'm the shepherd over these sheep. I lay down in the gate at night and when a wolf comes up I fight him with my bare hands. The Bible said David killed a bear with his bare hands. 
tore the, tore the uh, jaw off a lion with his bare hands. Why? To protect his sheep. And God is going to tear the mouth of the devil off when he comes after you. And God is going to defeat that devil for you. He is the great shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And when he says, I shall not want, what does that mean? I don't have to want to go to a wicked movie hall and entertain myself with something wicked. Opposite from God. Opposite from my nature. I have a spiritual nature. It's different than that nature. I don't have to watch television to entertain myself with wicked stuff. Uh, just by accident I see enough wicked stuff without joining in on it. Just by accident. Hey, the signs were written for us that we could find a solace in those signs. The Song of Solomon is the love story of Jesus coming on this earth and giving His life for us. And the waywardness in the Song of Solomon of the one leaving their love, their first love, and getting in a muddle. And that, that's a, a precious book. And then we had First and Second Samuel. God dealing with a man in a great way, showing how Samuel came up, how Samuel got defeated within himself before and then came back. That God has always stayed with us and will stay with you through it. And then we had first and second kings. Those were the kings. God allowed them to have kings. Some were good kings. Most were bad. If I remember right, in our studies of all the kings that were in Israel, there was only a couple of good ones. All the rest were oppressing kings. They said, I'm now the king. I'm going to get all the change I can get out of every man. I'm going to exact everything I can get out of him. If, if it takes two cents for him to stay alive, and that's all he can do is stay alive, I'll let him keep two cents so he can stay alive so I can get the rest of his money. And that's what the kings did. And they oppressed the people. Then we had Chronicles. First and Second Chronicles is a very difficult book to read, but if you'll read it with wanting to get the knowledge out of it, you'll find out it chronicles everything that happened all the way up to Chronicles in the Bible. When God created the heaven and the earth, it chronicles the people of Israel. The Jewish people. That's what Chronicles does. And so, uh, we have the chaotic kingdom stage listed for us and tells us about it in First and Second Kings and in Chronicles 10. We find in Jonah, in Amos, Hosea, Joel, Obadiah, Nehemiah, Isaiah, Micah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah, Lamentations, we find all of the things chronicled for that time. Those are that relatively small books. Open up to one of them and read it. You say, well, oh man, that's got 29 chapters. Read one a day in 29 days. That's less than a month. You'll have read it. And then the next month, read it again. And the next month, read it again. About the fifth month that you read it, you will begin to see what you're reading. The first month you read it, it won't mean much. The second month you read it, you might get a couple points. The third month you read it, you might get three or four more. But when you get to about the fifth or sixth month of reading that one book, you'll begin to see what you're reading. The Bible doesn't just fall in place for you. You need to read it to understand it. You need to get into it. God's the one going to get the understanding, but you've got to prove yourself that you want to know it. If you want to understand it, you can. You know when you're learning how to drive, how many times did you have to push that clutch? And you say, Dad, what's the matter? I can't get in gear. He said, push the clutch. Hold the brake. You push the clutch again. Yeah. Boom. Just like that. 
And then uh, you try to take off and it's <laughs> You remember that? What's the matter? You're in the wrong gear, son. There's four gears up there. Pull it down over here. And this is called low gear. And then when you get going a little bit, you push the clutch and put it up. That's called second gear. And then up here, third gear. Don't go down here now while you're moving because that's reverse. And then you pull it in reverse. Oh, we used to have them in the floor. You know, that would floor shift. And you'd shift that on the floor. And always got a fancy knob and stuck it on there. Thought you was king for root because you had it. But listen, this is life. And this is the way the Bible is. Bible is like regular life. You've got to get in it and follow it. Then we come to the New Testament. And the New Testament is the gospel stage. Now in the gospel stage, we have very many things that show us things. These stages are stages of Acts. We have a book in the Bible called Acts. But these stages are acts of God during these stages. One of the first ones is, is that we find the Trinity of God. This act is the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And what did the Father do? He spoke the earth into existence. Then he saw the earth in chaos and, and spiritually the devil had taken over. So he brings on a trinity. He takes the part of himself, which was the son, and he sends him down here to the earth. And the son brings with him, when he comes on the earth, the Holy Spirit. So here's the father still in the son because he is the father of the son. And then he comes on the earth in a body, Jesus, and then he has spirit, the Holy Spirit. He is allowed to bring the Holy Spirit and leave the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost when he goes to the cross and he says, it is finished. He turns the Holy Spirit loose. And the Holy Spirit is in, limit, limit, uh, in limbo in the sense of the word for a few days. When these guys, they go in the upper room. There's 120 of them in the upper room. Wow. Can you see 120 men and women on this earth put in one room in one place day and night for 10 days? Boy. It's not good terminology, but I can see all hell breaking loose. And Peter, he don't, he don't like this woman. She don't like him. But God says to Peter, you got to make that right with that woman. But Peter has to go over there and say, hey, you know I don't like you and I don't know why. I did that before with a man. He has to go over and say, I don't like you and I don't like you. She goes, I sure don't like you and I know why. <laughs> he said, well, well, let's get this behind us. And will you forgive me? She says, yeah. And, and she says, will you forgive me? And he says, yeah. And they gave each other a hug, and it's right. Well, you got 120 people got to do that. Why was it 10 days before the Holy Spirit, before, God, before Jesus could come back? You know why? They had to get right. All 120 of them had to get right with each other. What would happen today if the church got right? If all those sitting on the left walked over to the right and said, will you forgive me for not sitting over here or not, not talking to you or not having anything to do with you. And those over there said, will you forgive me? And everybody said, will you forgive me in the church one day? Do you know what we would have? We would have a Holy Ghost revival. But you think you're going to get Miss Good Two Shoes over here to go over there and say, forgive me to Miss Bad Shoes over here? Or Miss Bad Shoes over here to go say, Mrs. Good Two Shoes, I think you're too good for your shoes. Huh? Do you think we're going to get that to happen? Pretty much, undoubtable, it's not going to happen. But that's what happened in the upper room. Because the Bible said, and they were all, A-L-L, -L, all, filled with the Holy Spirit. All. That means 120 people in one room got right with each other. Whew. 
<laughs> That's why it's only recorded one time, I guess, in the Bible, because it was only one time it ever happened. And you ain't going to get 120 people today to get all right with each other. You ain't going to hardly get 10 people, put 10 on this side, jerk 10 on that side, and have them meet right here. And say, is there anybody in these 10 that you have something against? And be honest. We're going to find out that we're all judgmental. And most of us don't have a clue what we're talking about. What somebody said about somebody does not make it true. If somebody said something bad about somebody, that does not make it true. Because they said it, they might just be blabbermouths. Blabbing about what they don't need. No, don't even know. Just blabbing. So we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. The doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of the Father, and the doctrine of the Son, and the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, those four things are the true doctrine of the Bible. Now let's go on. The doctrine of man. That is man. God created man. He bent down. He breathed the breath of life in the nostrils of that man laying there and gave that man a physical spirit the spirit of a man that made him get up and walk and see and talk and hear. That was the spirit of the man. That was not the Holy Spirit coming into that man, but the spirit of a man. Then he gave the doctrine of the church. That is a group of people that come together and worship God collectively. And then he gave the doctrine of sin. That is a group of people who are in the world outside of the church who are still sinners and living in that sin. Even those in the church are sinners, but they're forgiven sinners. That's the difference, and they're supposed to walk different. Then we have the doctrine of salvation. That's what we got when we were a sinner and said, God, forgive me of my sin, come in my heart and save my soul. Then we got that. Now look at this one. The doctrine of Satan. What is the doctrine of Satan? That he's wicked. He's opposite from God. And everything that is opposite from God belongs to Satan. And Satan is the one that comes to stick the stick in the wheel to make the wheel quit working like it's supposed to. And then we have the doctrine of angels. If you'll study angels in the Bible, the angels, have, there are classified people that God made. There are archangels. There are war angels. There are angels of good tidings. There are many angels of different types that God made. We don't know too much about them. But we do know they're called angelic beings. We do know that they're invisible but can be made visible. We do know that we've been visited by angels. We do know that every single one of us has an appointed guardian angel. When was my guardian angel the most used to me in my hellish life? He kept me from death many times. I challenged death. I challenged it when I was a sinner, a lost sinner. And, the, and my angel took me through it. I can tell you stories that would make you cringe. Why aren't you dead? The police come to a wreck that I had and said, why aren't you dead? How come you're out here? How can you be out here? You were in that automobile. I said, yeah, I don't know, but here I am. God had a reason. The doctrine of the Bible. The doctrine of the Bible is a doctrine of past, present, and future. It is the prophecy of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost given to a group of people who carry the term Christian on their life. Are you a Christian? Can you prove you're a Christian by your daily living? Not to anybody else. Can you look in the mirror in the morning and say, I am a Christian today. I am living like a Christian today. When I got my first thought this morning was thank you, Lord, for this day. When I got my first, my last thought last night, when I closed my eyes to go to sleep, I said, God, thank you. 
give me a good night's sleep. God can give me a four hours sleep. In 24 hours, I can sleep four hours. And I'm ready to go again for 20 hours. Why? God has made me that way. God has made it to where I can do that. He allows me to have four hours of godly sleep. Four hours of good sleep. Four hours of uh, spiritually meditation sleep. The kind of sleep that only God can give. All of these things I just mentioned, the 12 doctrines of the Bible, those 12 you need to be followed, you can follow those. There are six under those that talk about the cities mentioned in the Bible, record the conversations of the Bible, the miracles of the Bible, the occupations of the Bible, the parables and the prophecies of the Bible. Those are six other contents of this book, the Bible. And then we find out the different people God used, and He's still using them. He's using Greeks, He's using Italians, He's using Germans, Russians, Americans. Let me show you in the Bible the ones He used. He used the Canaanites, the Samaritans, the, the Philistines, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Syrians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. They are all listed as being used by God in the Bible. Some for good and some for bad. And then what do we have? We have periods. Periods of where one group over there in the Holy Lands took over the land. The Romans were one of them. Every empire over there at one time became the Roman Empire. And then another, a little old man came along. And, and it, from what I understand, he died in his 20s of a broken heart and had to kill himself because he couldn't stand it because there wasn't any more world to conquer. He conquered all he could. And then, and then so we had, that was the, the Byzantine period. And then we had the Persians arose. And we see that God gave us a lifetime picture when the Persians made that great statue with a head of gold all the way down to where we are today. We're in the feet of iron and clay. You mix iron and clay together and you can drive over it with a very lightweight vehicle and crush it. And that's where we are today. America is the iron and clay. All we've got to do right now where we stand is have a Volkswagen come by and run over us and we will be crushed. We're going to fall from within. Then we had the Arabian period, the Sulkut period, the Crusader period, the Mamluk period, the Turkish uh, and the Ottoman period, the British period. You remember who was here in the United States? The British. Who were they fighting? The Spanish. <coughs> British and Spanish were fighting for this land that's America now. And a little old group came up and fought them. What, what really, when I study in, really study in history, what killed me is here comes a, a Spanish uh, uh, gilded a, a, a boat coming in. And they look up on the banks and here's a, a bunch of Indians looking down, seeing, what are these? What's going on? And they fire their weapons on the Indians and kill the Indians. They hadn't met them yet. They're not enemies. They considered everything that wasn't them as an enemy, so they thought they were the kings. And by the way, they were kings. They brought kings in. And England brought kings in. And they wanted this place run by kings, but then we had some good men come along said, no kings here. We're going to be a different type. We're the Turkish, the British, okay. This is called the independent period where we now, we started in 1948, in Jerusalem, having an independent period in Jerusalem. But we started the United States back earlier than that. And so, uh, uh, the United States was to go along to be hand in hand with Israel. And we had to join up and back Israel. Well, our time's come and gone. This is Brother Peter.
the tidbits from the word. This show has been fun. This has been, so far, this has been one of the most funnest days I've had in a long time. I love doing review. Review is fun. If you studied it, you got an idea where you are, review is fun. And you can do it. Well, our time's come and gone. Remember now, if it's going to be a good day, it's got to be a godly day. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.